I ask you, if you will, to take your Bibles and look with me to 1 Timothy, the second chapter. 1 Timothy, uh, chapter number 2, and we will pick up where we left off last Sunday as we navigate through this little epistle. Uh, I've been praying and seeking the Lord about where he would have me to go from here, and uh, I am leaning and praying through um, the possibility of preaching on the home from Easter Sunday until Mother's Day. So I want you to be praying with me about that. Uh, today, I really, I didn't want to preach this message. I can be honest with you. I uh, come across a passage every once in a while that you just would like to skip over and get on into something else. But you know, when you are preaching through a book of the Bible and you go verse by verse and you do it expositionally, inevitably, you're going to come across passages like this. Now, I'm, I'm going to make some people uh, really disappointed in me today. Uh, there will be some folks that just flat won't agree with me today. And that's one of the beauty parts about being a Christian, I think, is that you know that I love you. Amen. And I know that you love me. Amen. And so we've got that love relationship. And we're not always going to agree on every subject. There will be times that we will just be crossed up. That we won't, we, we won't agree on a matter. And this may be one of those times that you're going to get kind of crossed up with me. But uh, according to the word of God, you still got to love me. All right, and I got to love you, and we're going to do that. Um, it's and I know inevitably I'm going to get emails and I'm going to get some letters or some phone calls about it, and we're just not going to agree about everything. I kind of feel like it's the father and son that were uh, along with their donkey making their way through one village after another, and. Uh, so they were walking beside the donkey, came into that first village, and the villager says, well, that's the silliest thing that I've ever seen in my life. You've got a perfectly good donkey there, sir. Why don't you ride that donkey instead of walking beside it? So he got to the next village, and he was riding on the donkey, and the little boy was walking beside him, and the villager said, child abuse, child abuse, child abuse. How dare you ride and let that little boy walk? So he gets into the third village and the little boy was riding on the donkey and the man was walking beside and the villagers said, you're raising a lazy kid. He'll never amount to anything. Get off of there and you ride. So he gets into the, the next, next village, village and, and they, they were both riding on the donkey and the villager says to them, Animal abuse, animal abuse. Well, the last village they were seen uh, carrying the donkey through that <laughs> next village. Criticism is going to come. Now let me help you understand that Paul is writing in the context of public worship. Would you say those two words? Public worship, say it louder public worship. Uh, he's writing in the context of the church, uh, if you will, not in society. This is not applying to the social relationship that we as Christians have, but he's writing to the body of Christ. So stand with me and let's begin reading in verse number eight, if you will. Um, First Timothy chapter two and verse eight. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or clothes that come from Nordstrom's. <laughs> I'm glad God put that in there but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence and with all subjection. 
But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. May we go to the Lord now in prayer. Father, as we seek today to impart the truth of your word, I pray, Lord, that it will be delivered under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Not for fame, not for fortune, but that men and women everywhere might be saved. I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's people said amen. amen. Now, as we begin to wade through this passage of scripture, let's all be reminded today that he has given us a really unique outline here. Uh, the first thing that he begins to do is that he gives us some advice for us men. And then secondly, he gives some advice for some women. And we're going to begin with the advice uh, that he is giving uh, to the men. He says in verse number eight, men, when we come together, let us lift up holy hands unto the Lord. That, that's a powerful directive. Now, he's saying to the men in the body of Christ, men, I want you to be prayer warriors. Prayer warriors. This year we've lost two of the most godly prayer warriors that I have ever known. But the Bible says that we as men uh, are to be looking after the spiritual things of the body of Christ. And while we are doing that everywhere, we are to be lifting up holy hands. Now, I'll say real quickly, that runs amok of our culture. American Christianity is not culturally prepared to receive this command. Uh, this word of God as we praise God. But the lifting up of the holy lands is not something that is done on a whim. It is rooted deep in Judea's history and Judaism. And it's deep in there. Turn in your Bible with me, if you will, uh, to the book of Psalms. And I want you to see with me in chapter number 28 and uh, verse number 2. Psalm 28 and uh, verse number two. Now listen as David says, hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto you. God, I'm in the midst of this prayer time in my life when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. L look at another passage just a few chapters away in chapter number 63 and look at verse number four. Psalm 63 verse four. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Turn on over to Psalm 141 uh, toward the end of the book. Psalm 141. And I want you to see with me verse number 2. 141 verse 2. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. He's talking about that sacrificial time in the evening when the incense would be burned and it would rise up as a sweet smelling savour into the nostrils of God. David is saying, I want my hands to be lifted up symbolic of the fact that I want you to be pleased with my life. And then he says, I want it to be an extension of my love for you, Lord. Just like the sacrifice, just like the incense is an extension of love. Let my hands also be that. One more verse in uh, chapter 143, just right there, a few uh, words away. Notice, if you will, verse 6 in chapter 143. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a 
thirsty land. When Ezra was beseeching God on behalf of Israel, the Bible says that he lifted up his hands before the Lord. Solomon, in the longest recorded prayer in the Bible, when they were dedicating the temple unto the Lord, the Bible says that he lifted up his hands to the Lord. Paul is saying to Timothy here in this passage, I want the men in the body of Christ to follow suit what our forefathers have taught us and what God is revealing to us is that we lift up our hands in praise and in adoration and obedience unto him. <coughs> now, what was the significance uh, of such a posture? What, what, what does it really mean? Because you and I both know that that runs totally against the culture of our day. Now, it may run, listen, it may run against the culture. It may run against the grain of where we are today. It's not normal, no doubt about that. It is not natural, no doubt about that. But I can tell you, friend, it is biblical. It is biblical. You ever wonder when you see people when the songs are being sung or when they are here at the altar in prayer, have you ever wondered why people lift up their hands? What's the significance behind that? Why do people do such a thing as that? Well, let me help you understand. First of all, it symbolizes desire. We desire intimacy with God. We, we want to get into the very face of God. We want to get into the very presence of God. And it is a symbolic desire of us entering into an intimate time with the Lord. And the symbolism behind it is the lifting up of the hands. I want intimacy with God. Yesterday, uh, I got my hair cut, both of them. <coughs> And a uh, young lady in our church um, takes about two and a half seconds to take care of that haircut for me. And yesterday she had a little two-year-old daughter with her and uh, she came running up to me and she lifted up her hands right at my feet. I, I want you to hold me. I want you to love. I want you to extend your love to me. My grandchildren, when they were much smaller and much younger, they would come running after they hadn't seen me in a long time. They would come running toward Papa. Papa, Papa. Now, I don't want them to do that anymore. <laughs> but, but, I, but I promise you, I didn't say to them, get away from me, you little charismatic. No, no, no. When they came running and lifting up their hands, Papa reached down and he picked them up and he loved them. So it's a symbolism of desire. It's a symbolism of intimacy. David is saying, God, I desire you more than anything else. Second, it symbolizes an extension of the love of God. I mentioned that a moment ago when I talked to you about how that uh, David is comparing it to the evening sacrifice and to the incense that was burned before God that rose up before God as an extension of love of the people. This is an extension of our love to God. And then third, it is a symbolism of surrender. Now, we all know that the international symbol for surrender is your hands are up. I, I, I surrender. When we lift up our hands before God, we are saying, God, I relinquish all control of my life over to you, God. It's you that I desire. The Bible says, men, we are to lift up holy hands. It's a symbol of desire. It's a symbol that we are extending our love to God. It is a symbol that we are surrendering to God. Notice what he says here. He says, without wrath. What does that mean? It simply means that 
when you go before God that there's nothing between you and another person that would hinder that prayer time. It means that you don't have any anger or hostility toward another individual that needs to be settled before you go to God in prayer. I'm coming before you, God, and my hands are extended. And as best as I know, God, there is nothing between me and somebody else. But then he says, without doubting. You'll find that same word over in James chapter one. That if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And he says in that little context there that we are to ask God without doubt that God is going to do it. And God says, I will give it to you and I will give it to you lavishly. In other words, you're going before God and you're going without doubting. You're not saying, well, God, maybe you will or maybe you won't or maybe you will or maybe you won't or I think you will. or I, It's nothing of that. You're saying, God, I believe Without doubt, I am extending before you. That, that, this is exactly why that when we are praying for sick people, when they come before here and they want the anointing uh, of the oil on them and they want the church to pray for them, it's why every time, just like yesterday with Brother Steve McQuaid's, Brother Steve got uh, a tough word yesterday that the doctors have done all that they can do and hospice is called in and, and, and Steve is saying, you know what my wife told me years ago, preacher, either way I win and before I left, I said, Steve, I want to pray for you. And, and I didn't pray, well, God, maybe you can or, or God, it's possible for you to. No, when the sick are brought before us, ladies and gentlemen, I pray for the ultimate. I pray, God, that you would eradicate that illness and that sickness totally out of their body from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, completely remove it and heal their body. I pray for the ultimate. Now, if God doesn't do it, that's none of my business. That's his business. He's sovereign God. But when I pray, I'm praying for the ultimate. And I'll leave the rest of it to God. So, we're praying. Lifting up holy hands, men. We're to be the spiritual leaders. We're to be before God, pure and holy and clean, and we're to lift up our hands. But now then, he gives some advice to the women. Now notice something about this, Greg. He only gave one verse for the men, and he gave seven verses for the women. Did, did, did you notice that? You ever wonder what that is all about? Well... The women are seven times more pretty. The women are seven times more gracious. The women have seven times as much grace. How am I doing, guys? Am I doing all right here? Am I, you know? But, but, but Paul thought it very important right off the bat to establish women's very vital role in the church her very encouraging, essential role and what that was to look like and what it was to be so that she would not get off track. Paul knew the power of a woman's life that would be unharnessed if it were not dealt with properly. Now, I've got my tomato-proof vest on this morning. And I, I know that some of the things that we're gonna say here today, it may rub some of you wrong. And I know for a fact that it is going to rub against the grain of the culture that we are, are living in. But ladies and gentlemen, when God called me to preach, he called me to preach his word. And I'm going to stand on what God's word says rather than what the culture demands. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about three or four things about what the role of this woman is. First, I want to talk to you about her appearance. Then I want to talk to you about her achievements. And then I want to talk to you about her authority. And then I want to wind it up by talking to you about her arena. Okay? So let's talk about the appearance. Notice verse 9, if you will. I will sing a new song. Well, I've got to get out of 
Psalm and uh, get over here in Timothy. Uh, I'm going to be singing a new song here, aren't I? <laughs> in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or clothes from Nordstrom, expensive clothes. Now, don't get hung up on that braided hair thing. It's not what we think today. In Paul's day, uh, these women would uh, get the most expensive and outrageous hairdos that they could muster up and uh, they would go into the pagan temples of worship. And Paul is saying, I don't want you women to draw attention to yourself. This is the hairstyle of the prostitutes that were active that day, both the, the Greeks and the Jews that practiced their wares out on the streets of the city. He says, I don't want you to wear your hair in a manner that is going to be attracting people to you. You need to dress modestly so that it gives God uh, the glory. Now to understand this, you also have to understand uh, what First Peter says. So turn over there to the third chapter, the third verse of First Peter. First uh, Peter 3 and 3. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plaiting the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be of the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek, and a quiet spirit which is in the sight of God, a great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with uh, amazement. Now, in other words, what the scripture is saying, uh, he is saying to all of us in this uh, that we should never let the culture define us as children of God. That we are not to cave in to the culture of our times. Now, let me tell you what he's not suggesting. He's not suggesting that you go down here to Walmart and find the blue light special and just dress in, in that kind of clothing. It's not what he's saying uh, at all. Um, I grew up in a, and I've told you in my testimony a few times, uh, over on a textile mill village. I got involved in a church, and inside that church, uh, the women wore long sleeves, and they wore dresses down to their ankles. They had that beehive hair thing going on. Great big thing going on. They didn't wear makeup and they wore no jewelry. And that was across the board. You could not go to that church if you dressed uh, otherwise. A and we had a word for that and it's homely. <laughs> I don't believe that's what God's talking about here. I, I think every old barn needs a paint job every once in a while. You know, it's just Excuse me. Uh, God's not opposed for women to look beautiful and attractive. But he is saying don't draw attention to yourself, especially to dress sensual, to draw man's attention in a sensual way. In other words, when you're out in public, be careful how you dress. I don't understand the spray on clothes these days. I mean, literally, it's just, I, I, I don't understand that stuff. I, I don't understand mamas and daddies letting their little girls out of the house dressed in a less than modest dress. I, I want to say a word to the teenagers and to the young adults in this thing. If, if you could just give me a moment, listen 
to God's word. Dress modestly. Don't let the culture determine how you're going to live your life. Live your life to please the Lord. Now, let's look now at the woman's achievements, if you will, in verse number 10. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works? In other words, the accomplishments of Christian women will impress God by their good deeds, by their good works, not in status, not in position, not in title, not in some label that they may have, and it's certainly not becoming the most famous speaker on the circuit. That's not what God is saying. Uh, God is saying that God is, he himself is impressed by a woman's good deeds. The, the highest ministry when uh, occurs when you are dispensing good deeds, not only in the body of Christ, but we're gonna see a little bit later on how that that also works within the confines of the home. Now look at her authority in verse number 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now this is about the time that the hair stands up on the back of our necks. In silence. Paul uses this same word in the book of Corinthians. Let's think a minute about what it doesn't mean. He's not referring to the sound. He's not referring to a voice. It doesn't mean for women to shut up or to shift their mind in neutral or to check their brains at the door uh, when they come in, nor does it mean that you are to rubber stamp everything that goes on. That's not what Paul is saying. Uh, there are two Greek words that translate into silence, uh, and he's not suggesting at all that you lose the ability to suggest, you lose the ability to think or to ask questions or to dig. That's not what Paul is saying. But in the process of learning, understand, Paul is saying that God has set up an authority in the church and we are to be in submission and subjection to that authority. Now look at verse 12, particularly the Greek construction of verse number 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, the thing about verse 12, there are two things that are here together that absolutely cannot be separated. And it is teach and authority, authority and teach. One who had authority, teach. Teach in authority. They are inseparably linked together. Now again, let me clarify what he's not saying. Uh, he's not saying that the primary emotional makeup of a woman is less than that of a man. He is not saying that women are spiritually inferior to man. Paul said, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. So may I say to you that that is true in salvation. It is true in being filled with the Spirit of God. It is true when God dispenses the spiritual gifts. There are no differences. Can I get an amen to let me know that you are still with me? Now then, another thing that he's not saying is that women should not be an authority in the workplace. What he is referring to here is in the confines of the church. 
He's not saying that a woman can't teach in the church. Turn over with me to Titus, if you will, in chapter number two, just a few pages toward Revelation and pick it up in verse three. The aged women likewise, that they uh, be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine. Now watch this, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Powerful words. Paul says, I want women to teach. God help us. I would hate to think where First Baptist Church Indian Trail would be today if we didn't allow women to teach the Bible. I don't know where our children would be. I don't know where our students would be. I I just don't know where we would be as a church if we harnessed that spiritual gift that God has given to so many of the godly women uh, in this fellowship. But he says, I permit no woman to be in authoritative position over a man while she teaches. Now, there are two reasons. I held up one finger. I'll hold up two. There are two reasons why Paul says this. Now, many people today would take this passage of Scripture, and you've heard it, and I've heard it too, and they would simply say, well, now wait a minute, Pastor. Paul is talking about the culture of his day, and that applied to the culture of his day. His day. This is the 21st century. We have a different culture today and it doesn't apply to us. I am always flabbergasted and amazed at the serendipity approach that many people take to interpreting the Bible. And they will take this passage over here and they will say, oh, that was for their day. It's not for our day. And then they would take a passage over here. Well, yeah, this applied not only to them, this applies to us. This does doesn't apply, this does. This doesn't apply, this does. Why in the world, folks, when we are studying and interpreting the scripture, can we just not take the Bible for what the Bible says? And so he gives two reasons why he has stated what he said. Number one, he says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And then number two, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam was born first, Eve sinned first. Therefore, she's not to have and be in an authoritative position over a man while she's teaching. Now hear my heart a minute. If you go and look at every commentary that there is and study this out, the Greek terms, word studies, uh, look at the commentaries, remarks about that passage. Here's what you're going to discover. You're going to discover in the midst of all of that, there is absolutely no rational explanation behind these two reasons. I'll say it again. You won't find a rational explanation behind the two reasons that he gives. Now then, because I can't understand it, I don't understand this part, I don't understand a lot of stuff in the Word of God, but because I don't understand it does not minimize whatsoever the impact of it. There are a lot of things down here that I don't know about God. By the way, Our pea-sized brain won't ever figure out all the ways of God. Does that mean that I am not going to obey it? Absolutely not. I am not going to reject what God says, even if I can't understand it. God's order of men is to be in the authoritative position in the church. Now, let's look at the woman's arena for a minute, and I'll have to quickly go in verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. What is this? Why is it here? 
let, let me say this. He's not saying that women, you're going to be saved because you're going to have a baby. We know that that's not true because a lot of women don't have babies, can't have babies. A lot of single people won't have babies. So we know that that's not true. He's not saying you're going to be saved from physical death if you have babies. By the way, men, if those two interpretations were true, you and I would be in major trouble. All right. Now, some people suggest that he's referring to Mary and Mary having uh, baby Jesus and Jesus being the way of our salvation. I don't think that that's what Paul is saying at all. I think you have to look at the context of what has been said up to this point to understand what he's talking about here. He's talking about the importance, the vitality, and the experience of women inside the church. He says salvation comes to them in the midst and in the course of the domestic affairs of their life. Having babies, being a housewife, taking care of uh, the home. How many of you have read Proverbs 31 lately? It's uh, one of my favorite passages of scripture. It's uh, Solomon and he is paying tribute to his mother. And if you read it and study it, you're gonna discover that this wife, his mother, committed all of her energies, all of her talents, all of her abilities to enhancing and to the building up of the home. Ladies and gentlemen, our penitentiaries are filled with young people today and they are there because the man did not assume the responsibility that God had for him and the woman shirked her responsibility as a mother. God has entrusted little ones to us. Let, can, can I just have a little confession time? It's good for my soul and, and, and let me... Let me just say a couple of things here in closing. I think one of the greatest mistakes that I've ever made in my life, and frankly, I, I, to be honest, I, I didn't have a mentor, and I'm not blaming that. I, I should have studied the Word of God closer to understand that I, I was teaching and preaching and going to school and working and doing all of that stuff. And frankly, I, I, let, I let something slip into my leadership that just, brings tears to my eyes today. Would to God, when I was leading my family in the early years, that I would have insisted that my wife stay home and raise our kids. But I felt like if, if I could get a bigger house, a nicer home, if I could provide more stuff for my kids, that let me just tell you, friend, if I had to do it all over again, I promise you this, I'd live a much simpler life than I did back then. There are a lot of things that I could have done without. There are homes smaller that I could have lived in. I don't know if I could have driven any worse cars than what I drove back in those days, but I could have lived in a much smaller home and a much simpler life. And I think the greatest injustice that I did to my kids and to my wife was positioned us where we needed and wanted that second income. God has entrusted kids to you, ladies and gentlemen. And, and you single moms, bless your heart. I love y'all with all of my heart. And would that God somehow, some way, someday down the road, it would become possible for you to be able to stay home with your children. I, 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 I wish that. I pray that for you. And I'd like to challenge all of you parents that are in here. Figure out a way. Make it happen. Be there for those kids. Get in that role that God has designed for you. God has given some major advice for us men and women. He says, men, pray and lift up holy hands. Be the spiritual leader in your home and in the church. And women, be that woman God would have you to be. As that man becomes the spiritual leader, you support him and you love him. You be that keeper in the home. Can I, can I just really be to the point with you? Women, I promise you, on the authority of God's word, not my opinion, but on the authority of God's word, 
you are never going to find the fulfillment that is rightfully yours until you discover the role that God has for you and you get in on it. I want you to stand with me, would you, all over the building? Matthew's going to come and he's going to lead us in this hymn of invitation in just a minute. Hey, I'm going to ask you men about something. Would you do this for me? I'm going to do it real quick and I want you to respond real quick. If you would admit before God, God, I just really hadn't been that spiritual leader that I need to be. And frankly, God, I don't have it within myself. Naturally, I just don't. But God, with your help and with your power, I want to be that man in my home. I want to be that spiritual leader in my, I want to be the man of God that you want me to be. I want you to leave right now, right now out of your seat. And I want you to just come and find a place here at the altar. You can stand or you can kneel and just simply say, you know, God, I am not that man that I ought to be. I want to be. And God, with your help, I will.